Um, it's really my pleasure now to introduce uh, Neil Deswani. Neil is the Chief Information Security Officer of the Consumer Business Unit at Symantec. Uh, he's going to talk to us about, um, you know, uh, about some issues that he has on his mind. Uh, one minute, okay, we're just getting a little prepped up here. But I will just say that um, I first met Neil actually at the NASDAQ. Uh, he came and spoke for us, uh, I think it was last October during our event on IoT. I think he'll bring some really interesting perspectives here on sort of what the emerging consumer threat landscape is. So here we go. I think we're, I think we're ready. I see him with a microphone in his hand. Thank you, Neil. Great, thank you, Michael. Okay, thanks. So can folks hear me? Great. Uh, so how many of you Remember your first car? Show of hands. Yep. I remember my first car. It was a Dodge Daytona. My father had gotten it for me. And I also remember what it had uh, meant to me. It had given me a lot more freedom, mobility, and independence than I ever had before. And with that new freedom, mobility, and independence. I was able to go to the local shopping mall. I was able to go to Dairy Queen. Uh, I was able to take my friends to Denny's. Uh, in fact, it's uh, getting close to lunchtime. Could use a little Denny's right now. But in any case, it gave me the ability to do all those things without pestering my parents. And when my friends and I got in the car, uh, we, you know, aside from my friends making a few jokes from time to time about my newfound driving skills, uh, we, we really didn't think much about safety. The car had seat belts, we put them on, it was a social norm even at that time. But that wasn't always the case. So if we go back to the late 1800s, when cars first started appearing on the market, cars didn't have seat belts. In fact, it wasn't until 1959 when Volvo introduced the first car with lap and shoulder seat belts as we know them today as an optional feature that such an important life-saving countermeasure was there. And in fact, it wasn't until 10 years after that until uh, there was kind of federally mandated regulation that all car manufacturers have to put seat belts in their cars. Now today, we have a lot of other safety countermeasures inside of cars. The cars have steel door frames. There are driver and passenger side airbags. There's uh, rear view mirrors that will light up if there's somebody in your blind spot. There's, uh, you know, steering wheels that'll vibrate if you start veering out of your lane. And then there's also collision avoidance systems where the car will start beeping at you if you're about to enter into an accident. And heck, you know, when I drive my Tesla these days, it pretty much uh, will, with the autopilot feature, more or less drive safely for me. But all of those things have come into place over time. And so now today, whether you're driving on roads where there's a high amount of traffic, whether there's low amounts of traffic, whether the roads are paved, whether they're unpaved, all those safety features come together to effectively try to prevent an accident. And if there is an accident, what it'll do is try to contain the damage. And it'll try to uh, you know, minimize the, the impact to, to the consumers in the vehicles. Now, just like the car, the internet has given consumers a lot of freedom, mobility, and independence that they perhaps haven't had as much of before. Consumers know that the internet can be unsafe. They may not understand all the details as we heard about earlier today, and they are actually constantly under attack. Um, if we look at some research from the Norton Cybersecurity Insights report from just last year, uh, consumers know that they have to protect their personal information. 79% of them know that they have to do something to protect their data. But 44% of them feel overwhelmed about the information that they need to protect. And they're just not quite sure how to do it. Now one day, one day it'll be the case that the hardware and the software that we use to cruise on the internet uh, will hopefully make it as easy as just putting our seatbelt on in order to safely surf the internet. Um, in fact, my hope as a technologist is that 
things will be good enough that the technology will put the seatbelt on for us. But until we get to that point, one thing that can be overlooked, and I want to talk about this today, is what are the things that consumers can do to put on the equivalent of their digital seatbelts? The set of things that they can do sometimes involves common sense, sometimes involves new habits, sometimes technology solutions. When seatbelts first were put in vehicles, it wasn't natural habit, it wasn't a social norm to put them on. But we need to, we need to get there. The final point that I want to make is that even today, where car manufacturers have to put seatbelts on the cars, it's still in the hands of the consumer to buckle up before they get going. So the final decision is in their hands. And there's a lot of reasons to buckle up. So if we look at the WannaCry incident, which has been mentioned a couple times today, uh, these kinds of attacks are, are increasing. In just a few days, over 200,000 machines across 150 companies were infected. And once it infected the machine, it encrypted the files that were on the user's hard disk or local storage. And the attackers would demand $300 in Bitcoin if you wanted them to decrypt your files so that you could use them again. Based on some new research from Symantec, the number of these types of malware incidents that involve ransomware specifically are increasing by 36% just over the past year. And the amount that the attackers are demanding in ransom has also been increasing by 266%. So in order for somebody to get victimized by WannaCry, though, there's got to be multiple dominoes that, that fall. And so what were those dominoes? Well, in order to be victimized by the WannaCry attack, the first thing that um, had to kind of go wrong is that um, one may not have been backing up files, either to an external hard drive or to a cloud service. You know, if you got hit by the ransomware and they're demanding a ransom by having encrypted your files, if you have a backup, you can just say, sorry, you don't have to pay your ransom. It's a done deal. The second domino that had to fall, as we've also heard about today, is regular patching of your operating system of Windows. And so there was a patch available for the particular Windows SMB vulnerability that WannaCry used in order to uh, infect a machine, uh, but a lot of people hadn't deployed it. So regular patching is uh, an example of something that had to fail. The third thing that had to fail is that victims clicked on a phishing email, uh, a malicious link in a phishing email, and that's what allowed the malware to come down via by drive-by download. And so the question is, what are the equivalent of the seatbelts here? Well, one seatbelt, as I mentioned, is backing up files. A second seatbelt is regularly patching your machine. And, you know, it might be okay if you don't do it right away, but do it later to, in the night. Do it the next day. Um, don't let it go for an entire month. Uh, and then the third thing that one can do is recognize the telltale signs of phishing. That might be an important area for further education. So. Those are uh, some of the issues that occurred with the, the WannaCry attack. Uh, the WannaCry attack, as I mentioned, did depend upon a phishing attack. Uh, we have a saying in the security community, and the, the saying is that attacks only get better. Phishing has been around for 10, 15 years, but the phishing attacks keep getting better and better. So one of the other phishing attacks that hit just the month before WannaCry did was a phishing attack against Google Docs. And the way that malware uh, spread, or actually it wasn't malware that spread, it was, a, it was a phishing attack where it would send you a link and there was a malicious third-party application that was claiming to be Google Docs and it would present the Google dialog box for, do you want to give this app permissions to read your email and to access your contact address book? And it was socially engineered so that people would click on it. And a lot of people did. Uh, even though Google was able to stop this attack within just a few hours, uh, it had spread to up to a million people. So this attack actually bared some similarity to the I love you and Melissa viruses from 10, 15 years ago. But as we can see, the, the attacks keep getting 
better. So being able to recognize phishing attacks can be an important area. Thinking about email, if we look at what happened last year with the Yahoo breach, it was the case that over a billion people had their Yahoo email susceptible to the breach, right? The way that the attackers worked is they were able to um, do a cookie forgery attack, which basically allowed the attackers to log into any Yahoo account without a password. And one might think, okay, well, it's just your email. But it's actually about a lot more than just your email. For those of you that are familiar with how a whole bunch of different online services work, the online services um, that, say, just relied on passwords, uh, if you, say, want to reset your password, what do they do? They send you an email, and they send you a link that you can use to choose whatever new password you would like. So if your email address gets compromised, then effectively it allows any other online service that you previously used with that email address to also be compromised. Uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of sensitive email that some people have, uh, ranging from tax records, uh, the contact of your bank, the contact of your brokerage, and all this information can be stolen. So uh, once the breach occurs, the damage has already been done. You can't undo it. So how do you wear your seatbelt in this case? Well, the first thing that you can do is, you know, for all the services that you use online, given that resetting passwords can be so easy if your email gets breached, uh, it's important to have not just your password, a single factor, but a second factor, something else that the attacker needs to get access to in order to get to your accounts. So if you use a two-factor code that gets sent to your mobile phone or you use a app on your phone that requires you to approve the login after you enter the password, it makes it much harder for an attacker to take an email breach and then turn that into a breach of other services. So that's one way that you can wear your seatbelt. The other way that one can wear a seatbelt is if you make the assumption, just given the fact that there's been over a billion records that have been stolen over the past 15 years, uh, and that it may be the case that your data is already stolen, it's already out there. The question is, when is somebody going to use it, and when is somebody going to abuse it? What you can do is get things like identity theft protection, so that uh, when your information gets abused, one, you, th there's a chance that you'll get alerted about it, and then secondly, you can, you can uh, have the problem fixed by third parties that are experts in the area. So that's um, you know, something to keep in mind with just how big these breaches are getting. But you know, it's also not just about securing your accounts and securing your laptop and your mobile devices. Uh, with all the Internet of Things devices that consumers are now bringing into their homes, as we saw last November, hundreds of thousands of these devices were compromised and they were used to send enough uh, DNS traffic to uh, Twitter and Spotify and CNN that effectively those services got knocked out for hours, and those are pretty serious services. So this is not just also about protecting yourself, it's about protecting your neighbor. Uh, and in this case, the neighbors happen to be internet infrastructure and uh, significant consumer services. So. Uh, what was the what was the seatbelt in this case? Well, it turns out that the vulnerability that the Mirai botnet used to do this attack was that a lot of these devices, consumer devices, were deployed by manufacturers with default passwords, and many consumers didn't change those default passwords. So consumers can, as part of the seatbelt, uh, change the passwords. But another thing that the manufacturers could do is not let those devices be used or used for too long unless that default password is changed. So there's many seat belts that can be employed. If we think about what things are gonna look like for the modern family, uh, let's take a, uh, you know, a common uh, husband-wife pair with a, with, with a child. They're not gonna get woken up in the morning by their alarm clocks anymore. Their alarm clock is their mobile phone. Once they get woken up by their mobile phone, they're going to check the screen on their mobile phone or some monitor that they have installed to see how's their baby doing. They're going to have a connected thermostat in their home that's going to automatically start increasing the temperature in the kitchen so that it's warm when they get downstairs. 
they're going to, as they pass the refrigerator, be seeing uh, displays of their family photos on the refrigerator. The calendar for the day is going to be shown on their smart TV. Their connected car is going to be checking the calendar to see whether or not there's enough charge in the battery to not just get them to their first appointment of the day, but get them to th through the entire day. Uh, their bank may send them an alert just letting them know that, hey, the, the 529 funds transfer for their kids uh, went through and that they now, just this past month, had enough uh, vacation savings so that they can go to Hawaii. So a lot of these consumers don't know what all the dangers are with all these devices and all the data that they're going to have access to. How can we protect the devices? How can we protect the online services, um, whether it's family pictures or whether it's uh, bank accounts? Well, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, good news with respect to the seat belts that consumers can take advantage of today. Our hope is that while a lot of these seat belts are currently optional, that more and more of them will become required over time. Uh, right now, it's going to involve employing some new habits. Uh, and that's not easy. We get that. Actually, the community of security com companies understands that. And we're working hard to create simple, easy to use solutions so that the consumers don't always have to worry about putting the seatbelt on. So it's, um, you know, it is a question of how do we, how do we secure everything, laptops, mobile phones, all the IoT devices. And I think that the, the title of this particular session is tell me about something that I don't know. So uh, here's something that you may not know. This is the Norton Core wireless router. It is a single device that replaces your current router, and it has a whole bunch of security defenses in it, uh, ranging from malware protection to intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, uh, IP reputation and URL blocking services so that if some device in your home does try connecting to a botnet, that connection will automatically get cut off. And this device was um, built with security and performance in mind. It has also been built to look cool. Uh, this design <laughs> was inspired by defense and weather radars that are distributed around the globe. Um, my hope is that uh, you know, when I get mine, uh, I'm going to display it out in the center of my entertainment center. I'm not going to hide it in the back where I currently have my, my router. So uh, this is just one way to, the, to rethink security. Security companies uh, are in this business of not just supplying one seatbelt, but supplying the steel door frames, the airbags, the video cameras, all of the different aspects so that we can help prevent, detect, and, and recover. And thinking back to um, my first car and the freedom, mobility, and independence that it gave me and all the life experience that it helped unleash, uh, as I think about my sons and thinking, of them, uh, thinking about giving them uh, guidance on what are the right habits, thinking about what can be done to help secure them online, uh, my hope is that solutions like this can help consumers uh, put the seatbelt on themselves as well as take care of the problems for them as much as possible. I think that the, the future is going to be pretty exciting. We, we do still have quite a bit of work ahead of us. The security industry is hard, working hard at bringing the pieces together. In the meantime, we encourage consumers to buckle up with the seat belts that uh, we have today, take advantage of some of the technology that will be getting deployed as optional today, but will hopefully be standard tomorrow, and enjoy the ride. Thank you. Really thank, you. thank you, Neil. Really appreciate it. I just want to say um, thank you again for all of you for coming today. Uh, really great program. Thank you for those who are watching online on Facebook Live. Thank you to the NASDAQ. Thank you to our wonderful sponsors who make this all possible. Uh, it's just curious, like, you know, I saw the geodesic dome. Some of us are old enough to remember, you know, they were pretty popular at one time. Maybe they'll be popular again in the future. Um, we really appreciate it. We'll be back here in October to talk about the Internet of Things. We're very excited about that because that will be National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which I'm sure you all know about, and so we'll all be participating in. So thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming, and thank you all.